Well, we are at the Always Ready Youth Apologetics Conference. So what are we studying? Apologetics. Apologetics. So I think it's important that we begin at the beginning and answer the question, what is apologetics? Now, ap apologetics, or where we get this word from, is from the Greek word uh, apologia, or um, yeah, apologia. And you can hear in that, that word the English word apology, or apologetics, of course. And it's important for us to understand that this Greek word does not mean to apologize in the sense that we use that word today. It does not mean that you're saying, I'm sorry for being a Christian. And I think it's really important, particularly for you, to understand that today in the, the age and the time in which we're living, because we're living in a culture where it seems that everything is tolerated today except Christians and Christianity. And I can understand that when you're in a sports team or in a classroom, the temptation even to, to perhaps want to shrink back a little bit and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian, and so I, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing that, or I don't believe that. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write down that you do not need to apologize or be sorry for being a Christian. And we need young people who are confident in their faith. And that is why we're hosting this conference, and this is why we're so encouraged that you're here. We want to be able to help encourage you and give you those, those answers to some of the tough questions. So, apologetics is not saying, I'm sorry. What is it? It is giving a defense, giving an answer for the hope that is within you. And we'll see that in our text today. It is giving a reason, an answer for the hope that is within you. Now, apologetics throughout the ages, there's been different approaches to apologetics, different ways that apologetics has been used. Sometimes apologetics is used to be able to clarify false beliefs about Christianity. Would you believe that in the early church, some of the early apologists, they had to respond to some crazy misconceptions about Christianity? So would you believe that some of the early apologists had to respond to the belief that Christians were cannibals. You know, cannibals, humans eating humans. And uh, how did they, they come to this conclusion? A misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper. Jesus saying, this is my body, and this is the blood of the new covenant. And so, some early apologists had to clarify that no, Christians are not cannibals. Or this one really blows my mind, that some of the early apologists had to actually argue that, that Christians were not atheists. People believed that Christians were atheists. Now, not, not in the sense that we use the term today, but because Christians did not believe in all of the Roman gods. Other times, apologetics is used simply to provide an answer to an objection to the Christian faith. Can I really trust the Bible? Like, how, how can I trust this book that's so old? What possible relevance could it have for me today? And we're going to be answering questions like that throughout the course of the conference. Also, apologetics is used to, to build a really holistic case for the validity of the Christian faith. Uh, philosophically, how can we um, make a case for Christianity? And we've had wonderful apologists that have gone before us and have helped us really be able to make a case for Christianity. So that's some of the ways that apologetics is used. But I want us to turn to the Word of God this morning. I'm going to look at a couple of verses from 1 Peter. So if you have your Bible with you or if you've got your Bible app, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And this morning, we're going to read verse 15 and verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Now, the last time we met together for an Always Ready event, it wasn't in person like this. We did a live stream event last fall, and I'm sure many of you joined us for that live stream event. 
Well, not long after that event, I had an experience that I have never had before. In all my time as a Christian, I have had the opportunity to preach in a pulpit, to preach on a street corner. I have handed out gospel tracts at a sporting event. I've had conversations with people over a cup of coffee. I've talked to people that were basically agnostic or atheists, you know, didn't really think much about religion at all, and I've had conversations about my faith with people that were very passionate about their false religion. But I had this experience last fall, not long after our Always Ready event that I'd never had before. And we had just moved house, and we're in a new home, and I needed a plumber to come over just to do some minor repairs and some work in the various bathrooms in this house. He came, he was doing uh, his work in the home, and he knew that I was a Christian. He asked me what did I do for a job, and I mentioned where I worked, and I worked at Ligonier and explained what that meant. And we're in the last bathroom. He'd been there for longer than he had planned, and he was kind enough not to charge me for that and apologetic that it was taking him longer than it needed to. And we're in this final bathroom, and I was happy to help him because I was learning about this new plumbing system in my house. And he's kneeling beside the tub. I'm there holding some of his tools, Our sleeves are rolled up, we're dirty and sweaty, and he turns to me and he says, what is the hope that you have? What is the hope that you have? No one in all my time of evangelizing or doing apologetics has anyone ever asked me this question from 1 Peter 3, 15, asking me for the hope that I have, or what's the reason for that hope? And so, I was flabbergasted, I was unprepared. I'd never been asked that question before, but I was ready. I was ready for that question, and I'll tell you how I answered it later this morning. So, as we look at 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, there are a few things we can learn here about apologetics, and the first thing we learn is that apologetics is your duty. Being ready, being prepared to give a defense of the faith is your duty. So, apologetics is your duty. Why? We've got to ask ourselves, who was Peter writing to? In this, in this letter, Peter is writing to ordinary Christians. They are experiencing persecution and suffering or will soon experience that, but he's, he's not addressing it to academics. Our, our next speaker this morning is the professor of apologetics at Reformation Bible College. Peter didn't have people like him in mind in particular when he wrote this epistle. He was talking to Christians in general and saying, you need to always be ready. You need to be prepared to be able to give an answer. And they were facing persecution. And so, the, the advice from Peter wasn't, you know, things are beginning to heat up a bit. There's, there's, a, there's persecution coming, so just quieten down on the whole Christianity thing. Like, if you just keep your mouth shut, we'll make it through the next decade. Um, no. He's saying, in this situation, where we're in the midst of persecution, you need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And so, if that was true for them, how much more true is it for us that even though there is opposition and intolerance towards Christians today, we are not experiencing persecution like these Christians did in Peter's day. And then Peter himself, a number of years later, would himself be a martyr for the faith. But don't be discouraged, be encouraged because God uses ordinary people for the most extraordinary ends. He uses ordinary people like you and me to work out His plan in this world, to save people, to help people understand the rationale of the Christian faith, even to shut the mouth of the accuser or the unbeliever. I think of my testimony. Essentially, an unbeliever invited me to church. He was, he was a professing Christian, but he was someone I didn't even know was a professing Christian. And he says, do you want to come to church with me tomorrow? And not too long after that, and that first time I walked into a church building, he abandoned his faith. He was never truly a believer. Or even think of Dr. R.C. Sproul. He was going back to his dorm room on his college campus to get a packet of cigarettes, and an upperclassman was doing a Bible study and just called him over. It was the first time R.C. had seen someone doing a Bible study and the Lord used that invitation to save him. 
So don't be burdened by the fact that this is your duty. Be encouraged because God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things in this world. So apologetics is your duty. It's also your privilege. Apologetics is your privilege. Consider this, God, the God of the universe, if you are a Christian here today, before the foundation of the world, He thought of you, and He determined that He would send His Son to live and die and rise again so that you would be saved and reconciled to Him. And He gives you this immense privilege that not only are you an ambassador of Christ, but you have this great privilege to be able to defend the truth claims of the Christian faith. We're living in 2021. We are in this age with Amazon one day shipping. We have videos and movies flying through the air, coming to our devices through Netflix and other services. We have new TikTok dances every single day that you can learn. And in this moment, God determined that you would be a Christian and that you would be the ones giving a defense, an answer for the hope that is within you. In this season of political, we'll say, tension in this country, you are the next generation. And He could have chosen that you lived a hundred years ago, but He said, no, you are here today in 2021, and you have this immense privilege to be this next generation of Christians who are called to give a defense for the hope that is within you. 1 Corinthians 1.21, Paul says the fool, that, that God shows the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Though the world thinks preaching is just foolishness, why would that be the method by which His Word would go out and people would be saved? And God sometimes uses our foolish and weak and feeble attempts even to defend the faith and the gospel to bring about His purposes, His plan of redemption in this world. And so apologetics is your duty but it is also your privilege. Thirdly, apologetics is under God's sovereignty. Apologetics is under God's sovereignty. You're not doing this alone. When you're sitting across the table from a friend, when you may be having a difficult conversation with your dad or your mom, maybe you're raising your hand in class, and just raising an objection to your science teacher. You're not doing it alone. The Lord is there. The Lord is with you, and nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing takes Him by surprise. He has ordained every one of those conversations that you've had or will have in the future, and that's why you must always be ready, because you never know when someone is going to say, what's the hope that you have? You might be on your knees next to a bathtub working with a plumber, And someone says, what is the hope that you have? Now, because it's under God's sovereignty, this is so liberating. Because the call for you as an apologist is to be faithful. You just have to faithfully share the truth of what you believe and why you believe it. God is the one that will determine whether that will be a fruitful conversation. You just need to be faithful. God will make it fruitful. You can share proofs of the Christian faith, evidences, reasons. You share the proof. God is the one ultimately by His Holy Spirit who persuades people to believe. You're called to confess your faith before men and women and friends. You confess your faith. God is the one who will convince them of that faith. So it's so liberating to know that the work of apologetics is done under God's sovereignty. Fourthly, apologetics is a holy calling. Apologetics is a holy calling. Let's have a look here at verse 16. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Right next to this call to give a defense for your your faith, buttoned up against that is a reminder to have good works in Christ, that your good behavior, your good works would put them to shame. You see, you cannot be a good apologist if you're not a faithful Christian. It's not enough just to have the arguments, just to have 
the, the answers. You need to live the Christian life. You need to be a Christian, and it needs to be accompanied by good works. Honestly, if when you tell someone that you are a Christian, if that surprises them, if they're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that you were a Christian, there's probably a problem. That should have been the, the warning bells when my Christian friend invited me to church. I really was like, you were ser- I had no idea. Okay, that shouldn't be a surprise. No one should be surprised when you tell them that you are a Christian. So are you following Christ? Or are you following the ways of the world? When people look at your social media feed, do they see someone following Christ? When you raise your hand in science class, is that teacher going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I see that their life is different to other people. Or are you, are you the bully in your circle of friends? Are you the one that shuns the new kid? And you're not loving, you're not gracious. We want to make sure not just we have great arguments, but by God's grace, we're actually walking in holiness. Apologetics is a holy calling. And fifthly, and lastly, apologetics is an act of love. It's an act of love. If we look back there in verse uh, 15, it says that we are to do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. We're not seeking to win arguments. We're seeking to win souls. Apologetics is an act of love. I was reminded recently by Dr. Nichols that the reason that we can give our answer with gentleness and respect is because we remember that we were once hostile to God. We were once God's enemies, and God was gracious to us. He reached down and saved us. So we too can be gracious and respectful and loving as we seek to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And this is simply an outworking of one of the great commandments. Jesus said these two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And so to love your neighbor is to give them the truth. It is the most loving thing that you can do is to tell someone the truth. So when you're tempted, as I said earlier, perhaps to shrink back and think you know, and, and apologize and say, I'm sorry for being a Christian, the most loving thing you can do is to tell them the truth. So I'm not saying that to be a loving apologist is to hide the truth. We need to be very, very clear, and that is the most loving thing we can do, yet we do it with gentleness and respect. So I probably should tell you what was the answer that I gave this plumber. So, as you know, we're sitting there or kneeling down, and he says, what is the hope that you have? And I'd never been asked this question before. And I'm going to tell you what I said, and I'm sure some of you will hear my answer and think, I could have given a better answer than that. I'm sure there's some people watching online far smarter than me and just think, I can't believe he said that. But I'll tell you what I said. He said, what is your hope? And I said, my hope is heaven, but not because I'm a good person and not because I deserve it, but because Jesus lived the perfect life that I could never live, and Jesus died the death that I deserve, and my hope is in Him, and I trust Him to take me to heaven and that I'll be there with Him for eternity. That's how I answered that question. But I was ready. I could have flubbed, I could have, I could have got flustered, but I had an answer. And our hope for you today is that you will have an answer when someone says, what is the hope that you have? But my question to you this morning, and this really is the most fundamental question, is that your hope? Is your hope in Christ? Is your hope that He lived for you and died for you and your sins are forgiven and you'll be with God, with Jesus, eternally. Because if that is not your hope this morning, then we do not desire for you to learn the best answers to the greatest objections of the Christian faith. That's not our hope this morning. Our desire, if you do not know God, is that you would know Him and that would be your hope. And we would be so thankful to know you walked out of this building today trusting Christ for the first time. If it is your hope, our desire is that you are going to be enriched, emboldened, 
to have a confidence that you won't shrink back, but you'll be able to give an answer for the hope that is in, in you. So as we close this session, I'd like to pray and pray for those here who may have been dragged along by their youth group but don't truly know Christ. So join me in prayer, would you? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your Son. Thank you that he died to save sinners. And Father, if there is anyone this morning that does not know you, that their hope is not in Christ and the gospel, we pray that everything they hear today as your word is read, as conversations are had, as objections are answered, that your spirit would work in them and you would grant them repentance and faith and that they would trust you. And we pray for the many believers here. We thank you for the work, your work in their life, that you would bring them to an event like this. And we do pray, Father, that today would give them a bold yet humble courage and that you would use them as this next generation of Christians who would give a bold defense of the hope that is within them. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and for His glory. Amen.